Masechet Kiddushin, Daf Dalid. We're learning about the source for Kiddushin Kesef. How do we know that you can effectuate Kiddushin with money? We saw all the way in the beginning on Daf Bet, one source, Kiha Kiha Misede Efron, says uh, regarding Kiddushin, Ki Kach Ish Isha. We're going to get come back to that derivation. But on yesterday's daf, we saw another derivation, which was via se'ah hinam and kasef. You have this double language regarding an ama ivriya, once she reaches an age of na'arut or bagrut, as we're going to see right now, she goes free and no payment is given to the master. That master gets no payment, right? That's via se'ah hinam. The extra words, and kasef, what do you need that for? That's there to tell you a contrast this master gets no money but there is another so-called master that's a father that when a father marries off his daughter then there is a transfer of money meaning kiddushin so that's how we know two things number one that kiddushin can be done with kesef and furthermore if it's a minor girl then the money goes to her father all right that was the second derivation so let's analyze that derivation more and then we'll talk about why why do we need two derivations for the same thing. Wait a second. You're telling me that En Kasef is an extra to teach us about Kiddushin with, uh, that goes to, and the money goes to the father? Hold on, we need it for this law itself of when a minor girl goes free in Ama Ivriya. As the Braita says, the first term, Yas Achinam, that teaches that when a girl reaches Bagrut, that would be 12 and a half. We're using 12 and 12 and a half as an average. It's actually uh, when she sees two hairs, then she's uh, Na'ara. And then six months later, from then, uh, is when she is a Bogeret. But generally, uh, 12 is the average. So we'll say 12 and 12 and a half. So I know that she goes free when she's 12 and a half Bogeret. Get it. Um, that's uh, from Yasa Chinam. The extra phrase and Kasef says actually it's even earlier when she is a Na'ara. She already um, has a right to go free. Um, the uh, the master has a responsibility either to marry her or marry her off to his son or if not then he has to let her go free. Okay, so that's what we need. We need the double phrase for Bagrut and Na'arut. So we don't have an extra phrase in Kasef to teach us Kiddushin. Amaravina in Kendama Kira En Kasef or read An Kasef. My En Kasef, En Kasef La Don Ze, Aval Yesh Kasef La Don Ahed Omani, who Ravina says, actually, I could learn two things from this phrase because it could have been written Haser without a Yod. En Kasef, I uh, mean, you know, it's still could be pronounced en kesef even without a yod. The yod is just an em hakriya, it's just a vowel letter. And since it doesn't write it uh, without the yod, without the yod, I would know um and uh, kasef without a yod. So then I would know that she goes free as a bogedet and as a naara. Why does it have the extra yod? To teach me something else that this master does not get uh, money, but there is a different master who, when the girl goes free, uh, leaves, uh, not go free, but leaves his uh, domain, that that master does get um, uh, uh, money. And who is that master? That's a father that when he marries her off, she leaves his domain, but she, but he gets compensated. It's not really compensation, it's just a kidushe kesef, uh, but that's what it comes to learn. Good. We might did, we might did that now we're going to go on a little bit of a tangent to ask, how do you know that you can learn something from an extra yod to begin with? Who said that? The Tanya Vizera and La. So now we're going to bring another pasuk that has also the word en. Um, and which we derive something from the extra yod. And now this pasuk is talking about a bat kohen who, when growing up, can eat teruma under her father's house. But then she goes and marries a non kohen. While she's married to the non kohen, she cannot have teruma. She's under that husband's domain. Now, if that they get divorced or they die, and she has no ch- children uh, from that marriage, then she goes back to her father's house, and she can once again eat teruma. However, that's only true if vezera en la, if she has no children. If, however, she has a child from that kohen, um, then that she is then still connected to the husband, although he's deceased, 
uh, she is still connected to him through the through the child that they share, and therefore she cannot eat she cannot eat teruma because um, she doesn't really go back to her father's house. She's not single anymore. Um, she's not alone anymore. She still she has a child and thereby still connected to the husband. So that's the that's the basic law, the peshat of the uh, pasuk. Now the midrash says furthermore, and the elazara zera minayin. What if they don't have a child but they do have a grandchild, for example? If the again the bat kohen married a non kohen and they have a child, see in the case where they have, let's say, have a child and the child died and the father died, so then she goes back to her father's house. She can eat. She can eat um, and Let's say there's no children and no grandchildren. However, then she goes back. However, if she a bat kohen marries a non kohen, they have a child. That child has a child, and then the middle person dies. Right? The this uh, bat kohen's. Uh, let's say son dies, but she still has a grandson that's alive. What about in that case? Does that still keep her connected to her husband, uh, deceased husband, such that she cannot eat Tiruma because he was not a Kohen? How do we know that? Uh, we learn it from the extra Yod in this word En. Um, if it was written without a Yod, I would only know about a child. But from the extra Yod tells us I could read it not all as an En, but like as if it ha- ha- was read with an Ayin. Ayin La. Go and investigate don't just look superficially to see if she has um, ch- children look at a next generation also to see if there are any grandchildren so you see we do learn something from the extra yod and we learned even another halacha um, uh, from this extra yod that I would, I would only know that she is connected to her deceased husband with if she has le- a legitimate child if there was just, that was a kosher marriage and she has a perfectly kosher uh, child or grandchild but what if let's say it's uh, the child is a mamzer because there was something wrong with that relationship um, how about how about in that case? Does she still also stay connected to her husband and cannot eat teruma? And the answer is yes, because of the extra yod. We're reading it not end, but ayen. Go and investigate and find if there's any child, whether kosher or uh, mamzer. All right. So you see, we learn from here that you can learn a halacha from an extra yod. But now we challenge the fact that we learned two different halachot. How could you learn two different halachot from the same thing? We already used that extra yod to teach a grandchild. Now you can't use it also to teach if the child is a mamzer. So the answer is No, we don't actually need to learn about the zerazara about a grandchild because we have a principle that a grandchild is just like a child. This is very important, right? Grandparents are essential. They have to take care of their grandchildren. Grandchildren also have to give respect to their grandparents. And so that bond, even though it's a generation apart, um, is still considered the same. And so a uh, child, grandchild, I don't need a special lo- uh, pasuk to teach me that. Rather, this pasuk, the extra yod, is teaching only the, that a uh, if the child is not kosher, is a mamzer, pasul, even so, is still considered a child and still is sufficient to connect the wife to her husband and thereby not be able to go back to her father's house to eat teruma. Good. Okay, so now you brought me another example of where I use an extra yod um, from uh, this uh, this law of eating teruma. But how does that Tana know, right? What's the... So, What's his source that you can do such a thing? We want a source from the Torah itself. Oh, we can find it from these other pesukim that says me'en bil'am, meaning bil'am refuses, or me'en yevami, when someone is doing halisa, then the, the yevama says, my yavam, my brother-in-law, refuses to do yibum. All right, in both cases, it 
means uh, it means refuses. And in both those cases, it's written without a yod. And even though in other places, like in our two cases, uh, and kasef, and then this uh, one that we just saw, it's written with a yod. So how come sometimes the word is written with and sometimes without? Oh, so it means that the basic spelling is without. So therefore, anytime it's written with a yod, you can use that yod to derive something. All right, um, this is uh, grammatically problematic because uh, both of these examples, me'en, are not the word en. Uh, meaning not, but rather come from a root, me'en, mem alef nun, which means to refuse. It's a different root, uh, uh, actually, um, although there's uh, some similarity in meaning because they're both negative words. En means not, and me'en is refuse to. Uh, so, um, uh, okay, in any case, that's the um, Gemara is contrasting the spelling, the spellings of those two words, and that's how you know an extra yod is an extra yod. Now, uh, another question. We mentioned yesterday that there is a law that Maase um, Yadaim uh, go to the father. Where do we learn that from? From it says, Kiim kor ish et bito le ama. If a man sells his daughter as an ama, and it says the word bito and ama back to back, and we learn from that juxtaposition that just like with an ama, an ama ivriya, um, anything that she makes, the uh, that proceeds, the salary goes to the master. So too for a father, any uh, if a minor daughter goes and gets a job and makes stuff, then the, then the salary goes to the father. Uh, it's uh, fair because the father is uh, going to use that money to feed the daughter um, since um, uh, she is, uh, that's uh, well, part of his responsibility. Um, actually, it's a question whether, um, uh, to what age does the father, is the father responsible to feed his, uh, his daughters, his sons? Okay, but separate question. Okay, anyway, um, we learned from there that uh, a father uh, does get the Maaseya daim of his daughter. And we tried to, uh, yesterday, we tried to derive from that fact a proof that for Kiddushin also, just like a father gets Maseya Daim, so a father should also receive the money for Kiddushin. We ended up rejecting that proof because uh, we only knew that we knew it for Ketana, what about for Ne'ada? Okay, but now we're asking, why do you have to tell us two, two different laws that um, the father gets Kiddushin, right, which we just lo- learned from uh, and why do you have to also tell us the law from Kim Kor Ishet Bitole Ama that her work uh, salary goes to the father? Why can't we learn one from the other? And the answer is If you only learn, learn the law of Kiddushin that goes to a father, I would say there, fine, it makes sense because she didn't do any work. She's just sitting there right looking pretty and some guy comes along and says here I want to give uh, you a a, uh, a ring um, and so since she didn't work for it so it makes sense that the father should keep it but if she's going out and sewing and farming and doing work and making something and making money then I would say that she deserves it so that's why I need the pasuk regarding Maaseyadeha on the other hand if you only told me that her salary goes to her father I would say, fine, that makes sense because there's a trade. The father gets the salary and in turn, he feeds his daughter. So there's a, right, there's a give and a take. But for Kiddushin, this money of Kiddushin, that just comes from an external source, a third party. The suitor comes and says, here, I'm giving you money. He, the father, doesn't give the daughter anything uh, in exchange for that. So since the father is not losing out on any, anything, um, so then that money should the daughter should keep. Regarding her work, right, she is giving, but she's also getting. So it makes sense that she should give up her salary. But uh, for Kiddushin, that's just something that she uh, she is getting. And the father's not um, the father's not losing out on anything because of it. So I might think that she should keep it. And therefore, I need the other pasuk and kasef that, to teach me that indeed, even in that case, the father keeps the kasef kiddushin. Gufa v'yaseachinam elu yeme bagrut en kasef elu yeme naarut v'dichtob lachama na naarut v'la ba'ay bagrut. Okay, we just quoted at the beginning of today's uh, daf. 
that ve'yas achinam, we quoted this Baraita, that the first phrase teaches me that an amavriya has a right to go free when she reaches bagrut. And the extra word, extra phrase in kasif teaches me that not only does she get out in 12 and a half, she even gets out beforehand at 12. And then the extra yod we saw is to teach us Kesev Kiddushin. Now we ask, why doesn't the Torah simply write one phrase regarding Na'arut, and I would not need a phrase regarding Bagrut. If a, a girl, a Ma'ivriya, goes free when she's a Na'ara, when she's 12, then she's already free when she's 12 and a half. I don't need, I don't need an, another, uh, another Pasuk. So why do, you have, why, do you have to, why do you have to give me a, a two pesukim, one for bagrut, one for na'arut? Just tell me about na'arut. And the answer is, See, neither of these are explicit. And so I need both because this one teaches me the other one. If I only had one phrase, I would say, well, I'll learn the least possible from it. I can't assume and jump to a conclusion that she gets, that she goes free at 12. I would assume the later possibility, which would be 12 and a half. So if I had only one phrase, I would I assume 12 and, a, 12 and a half. I need the second phrase to teach me not only 12 and a half, but also 12. So I need one phrase to tell me that the next phrase, I can add an extra chidush. So that's why I need both. I mean, it's not explicit. It could have said explicitly, you know, she leaves. Okay, if it said that. Um, then I only would need one phrase, but that's not explicit, so I need one to tell me what the other one means. And we'll give you another example. We're having a lot, lots of fun tangents here. Um, uh, uh, this is teaching that an Eved Ibri, uh, who is uh, owned by a Kohen, does not eat Tiruma. That's interesting, Halacha. Um, although, uh, if someone who is a Kohen, his wife eats Tiruma, his children eat Tiruma, his Eved Kina'ani uh, and Shivcha uh, Kina'anit, they also eat Tiruma because they are owned by him. And so all of his household eat Tiruma. But interestingly, an Eved Ibri, that is, although it's also called slavery, it's of a fundamentally different character than that for a Eved a, Kena'ani, a, 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 because the Eved uh, Ivri, the Jew, is not actually owned. He is called an Eved, but it's really more like a worker. Um, and therefore is not um, owned by, not part of the uh, Kohen's household. Okay, now, um, and we're going to derive this from the as double pasuk. Uh, it says, Toshab and Sachir, that uh, shall not eat of something consecrated, of Tiruma or Kodashim, of the Kohen. Why does it have a double, double word, Toshab and Sachir? Toshab teaches me that even if the Eved Ivri, uh, decides after uh, uh, six years he wants to stay and be uh, there forever, Kenan Olam, or at least until the Yovel. Um, even so, even though he's there for a long term, uh, still he is not considered part of the household and does not eat Tiruma. And Sachir teaches me that that is also true for a slave that's there for six years, um, also does not eat Tiruma. Now, uh, you might ask, why do I need both? Why not just tell me the first one, uh, the uh, uh, the word Toshav, and leave out Sachir? And I could make a Kavachomer on my own. I could say, if the slave who's there for 50 years doesn't eat Teruma, then all the more so, the Eved Ivri who's there only for six years will not eat Teruma. He's much less part of the household than the guy who's going to be there basically his whole life. And so isn't that a Kavachomer? Why, so why not just tell me Toshav and leave out Sachir? And the answer is, because if I only had one word, Toshav, I would say I would assume the least that this is someone who was working for six years. Um, but if he was working for 50 years, 
um, if a slave for 50 years, then he would eat teruma. So I need the word sacha, sachir, to tell me that uh, that toshav is um, there forever, right? So I need the uh, two words so that that will teach me that, okay, that um, I can go two steps, not only someone who's there for six years, even someone who's there for olam, evid olam, uh, also is not part of the household sufficiently to eat teruma. So that's the same, same idea here, um, is uh, we need two phrases uh, to teach me uh, uh, and kasef to teach me bagrut and na'arut besides the extra yod that we're not dealing with right now. Amale Abaye midame Abaye says you're bringing your proof from there from the 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 slave. It's not the same. These are. These are two different types of cases. This is over there in the case of the two types of slaves. Um, these are two different people, right? We're talking about two different categories of people. And uh, therefore, even if the Pasuk said regarding Toshav Nirsa, uh, should not eat, right? And I would know, Toshav, even if it explained that this was a Nirsa, someone who's there for 50 years, does not eat. And then it wrote also Sakhir, uh, meaning six years. So I could learn, I could learn a Kavachomet. If someone who's there for 50 years does not eat Tiruma, certainly someone who's only there for six years will not eat Tiruma. But nevertheless, sometimes the Torah bothers and adds an extra word even though you could read it from a Kabbalah Homer, just for the sake of clarity, it, it'll tell you, it'll give a, give a freebie, right? You don't have to work so hard to figure out the Kabbalah Homer. Listen, not only Toshab, also Sakhir. And it, it's fine. You can, uh, even though you can learn one case to the other case, if through a Kabbalah Homer, it doubles it up. So that's what I could have said over there, why it's double. I could, I could learn it from a Kabbalah Homer, but that's okay. Sometimes we double up. Um, the Torah does have an extra word sometimes. This is an important principle. Principle, right? The Abaye is saying sometimes the Torah ha- will have an extra word. But that's fine. It can have an extra word over there. But here, it wouldn't make sense. Because here, we're talking about the same individual person. Uh, everyone has to, before anyone who is, is a Bogeret, they have to be a Na'ara. We'll see one exception to that in a second. Um, but basically, in order to, to achieve um, an age of 12 and a half, you have to be 12 all first, right? So it's the very same person, not one, not two different kinds of Eved Ivri um, for six years and one for 50 years, but one one individual person. So if she leaves when she's a Na'ara, then what is she still doing there when she's a Bogedit? She already went free at 12, so she wouldn't still be there at 12 and a half. And therefore, these two cases are not comparable, and you can't say, oh, just like over there, it has two words to teach me that one te- one word teaches me about the other word. Uh, not true. Over there it has two words because it's redundant, and it's okay to be redundant sometimes, even though you can write a cup for a Kava Homer. The Torah likes to explain itself, and that's okay. But here, um, there's no, you, it's, it, here the redundancy is inexcusable. It's okay to have a redundancy when you can learn one a, 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 one thing from a Kava Homer to the other, because the uh, Torah will save you a step, not have to go through a Kava Homer. But here, it's not even a Kava Chomer. It's the very same person who's going from one stage to the other. And so here, the redundancy is just simply not excusable. And we're assuming that we, we're denying this principle that you'd have one word to teach me what the other word means, right? Because one word will be one step and the other then will be the next step, right? Abaye is denying that that is a rule and that that rule does not apply to Sakha, to um, Toshab and Sakhir. And therefore, that's not a rule in general. Ela amad abaye. So Abaye gives a completely different answer. Lo ela lebeger So according to Abaye, one of the words, viyasyachinam, that teaches me that she goes out as a ne'ara, because she's a ne'ara first, before she gets to bogedet. I don't have to deal with bogedet at all. So a regular, a regular healthy girl goes out, uh, she's a ma'avriya, she goes out as a ne'ara. What's the extra word? En kasef. 
that teaches me uh, regarding an Ailonit. An Ailonit is a, um, uh, a girl, then woman, who has uh, lacks signs of physical development. She never matures, she cannot have children, so she never actually reaches a level of Na'arut. Again, Na'arut is when she sees two pubic hairs, she never sees that because she doesn't develop in that way. Uh, rather, she goes straight to becoming a beg, a beged, um, a bogeret, uh, when she's 20 years old, right? That's the, that's the rule, right? We'll wait, we'll see. Uh, she's 12, 13, 14. She doesn't see any of these signs. But once she's 20, that's it. She is a bogeret. So actually she skips the uh, stage of na'arut. This is important because we were assuming, you know, it's okay to use shorthand and say 12 and 12 and a half, but actually it's not. It's dependent on phys- a, a level of physical um, maturity that she doesn't have. So how would I know? Let's say an ailonit is acquired as a nama ivriya, and now she's, uh, she's uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. She still um, doesn't, get, doesn't get these signs. So does she never go free? And the answer of en kasef is, to teach me that an Ailonit will go free at age 20. So, that's a regular Na'ara who's healthy. Ben Kasef is a Bogeret who's an Ailonit. Otherwise, if without that, I might have thought that an Amavriya only goes free as a Na'ara, but by, as a Bogeret, if she skips Na'arut hood, then she never would go free. That's why I need an Kasef. All right, that's Abaye's explanation for why we need both of these phrases. Um, uh, okay, Ma, but he agrees on the essential law. Challenges um, and uh, Abaye and says, actually, I could figure this out from my Kava Homer. If physical signs of maturity, um, they do not work to release someone from under the authority of her father, meaning a father can marry off his daughter as a kitana. He is allowed, continues to be allowed to marry off his daughter when she is a ne'ara. Even though she sees two hairs, she still remains under her father's authority. Uh, so, simanim do not release her from her fa- father's authority, but they do release her from her master if she's an ama ivriya. So then, bagrut, um, which is more powerful and because once a daughter becomes a bogeret at 12 and a half, then her father loses the right to marry her off. So bagrut is more powerful than na'arut in terms of the, as we see in the in case of a father and daughter. So all the more so, and odin shemosiyamashut adon, bagrut will be more powerful and allow her to go free and as an Amma Ivriya, I could figure that from a Kava Chomed. And so then I would know that the Torah only has to teach me regarding Ne'ara, uh, and I could figure out myself if there's an Ailoni who skips Na'arut, then she would still go free for in Bagrut because Bagrut is more powerful. And so therefore, I don't need the double language. So now we have yet a third answer why we need a double language. says, I still need the extra en kasef to teach me the very fact that an Ailonit can even be so as an Amma Ivriya in the first place. Saka da Techamina, Deat Ya Simane Narut Havezebina, Delat Ya Simane Narut La Havezebina, Kamash Malan via Seachinam. I might have thought a girl who has the possibility of seeing two hairs eventually, she can be sold. But if you have a girl, an Ailonit, who will not see uh, signs of na'arut ever, then she could not, she can't be sold in the first place. Therefore, it says the extra word, that's for a regular healthy girl. That's en kasef that will be given to an ailonit once she becomes a bogeret, but I still have to know that she can be sold in the first place, even though um, she won't be re- going out as a na'ara. Um, still, she can would be sold in the first place as an ama ivriya. All right. Now, next que- uh, uh, one more question on ulmor barav asheda marvelav kava homer who hamlinan milita dacha. Okay, according to marav asheda, who said, "Isn't it a kava homer?" He said, "It is a kava homer." Um, I can learn. Um, I can learn uh, uh, ailonit. 
from the case of a regular na'ada, from a kavachom, because bagrut is more powerful. Um, but don't we have a rule that uh, it's okay to um, say an extra word, even though I could learn it from a kavachom? So why do you have to use this the en kasef for something else? Why do you have to use it in kasef for the fact that she can be sold in the first place, and you're arguing with Abaye? Why not agree with Abaye? Abaye said, I need um, en kasef to teach me that Ilonit goes free from uh, for, uh, goes free as a bogeret. Morbad Abashes says, No, I already know that from a Chomer. Yeah, but we have a rule that the Torah sometimes will get, say an extra word. It's not extra. It is extra because you can learn it from a kavah chomer. But nevertheless, the Torah will give you um, an extra right cliff notes. Um, you can learn it from a kavah chomer and do all things. But it's giving it's going to give you the answer uh, to begin with. And sometimes it does that, so you don't actually have to learn yet something else from that word. And the answer to that is Okay, we only use this rule that the Torah bothers to say an extra word that I could have learned from when we have no other answer. All right, so then we're stuck. We say, okay, fine, it's an extra word. So I can, uh, can do that. Um, but if, there, if we have a better answer, well, we certainly would prefer to have a better answer. Okay, so this is really fascinating. Uh, so again, it's not that the Torah says extra words that just, you know, uh, are completely redundant, saying the same thing exactly twice. So that's not going to do that. But if it's something that, yeah, I give you A, you could, if you sit down for, you know, a couple of hours, you could figure out B, um, but you still, you have to, you have to, you know, sit and know that kavachomer. Kavachomer is not always so obvious. Um, so the Torah will um, tell you both A and B, even though if you really tried hard, you could figure out B. Yes, it does that. Um, that is a that is a principle, um, but uh, the rabbis would prefer not to use that if we can uh, if we can find a way that a and b teach completely different halachot that could not be figured out one from the other. Then that's preferable. We only fall back on this answer when we can't figure out any other reason why the Torah would say both laws. All right. V'tana maitela mehacha detanya ki kach ish isha ubala v'ya im lo timsachen be'anav ki masa ba de ervat arvad en kicha ela bekesev v'chen homed natati kesev asade kach mimeni. Now we're all going all the way back to the first derivation that we already saw. By the, but this is actually the original place because, um, as I mentioned, the first daf is added on by Rabbanan Sevora E. So that uh, mention of Kicha Kicha is actually quoting this, not the other way around. Okay, so now we, well, now we learn that the Tana is learning this halacha that you can use kese for Kiddushin from a Kalvachom, from a Gezerah Shava. It says if a man takes a woman, Kicha, um, and, uh, um, and, and so on, then he doesn't like her and divorces her, the rest of the law. So what is Kicha? Kicha means Kesef. Now when you say En Kicha Ela Kesef, um, this En Ela doesn't always mean literally that. That's the only meaning. It could have more than one meaning. Um, but it certainly does mean that because we say, it uh, says regarding Abraham, when he buys the field from Ephron, it says here, I have given you this field, take it from me, right? Take this money from me. So kicha is, um, is used in the context of a transaction with money. So, okay, that's the, that's the derivation from the, uh, from kicha kicha. Uh, but now, uh, we're asking. Why do I need a gezerah shava? Can I learn kiddush kesef from a kalva chomer? From an ama ivriya, she cannot be acquired through bia. A master doesn't acquire a ma'ivriya through bia with her, but rather through buying her. It's a monetary transaction. Um, so the ama'ivriya, you cannot use bia, but you can use kesef. So you see, kesef is stronger than bia. Therefore, a wife who can be acquired through bia, that's kiddushin can be done with bia. All the more so that kesef should work, right? Because we just said. Kesef is stronger than Bi'ah, so Kesef should certainly work for 
um, for a wife. So why do I need a a a, a um, a gezer hashavah, I can learn it from a kavachomer. And the answer is yevama, tochiach yevama will break that kavachomer. Sheniknet bebi'ah ve'naniknet bekesef. A yevama, you can only wait to, for a yavam to acquire a yevama, is through bi'ah, and kesef doesn't work. So we see kesef is not always stronger than bi'ah. These are two different uh, actions that have two uh, that have separate applications, uh, but then we'll say to that Yeah, but yevama is completely different category because a yevama you cannot acquire her with a contract, whereas a wife you can acquire with a contract. Contract is more similar to money, right? Contracts you use to acquire fields and things also. Um, so maybe we should forget about Yevama altogether and restore the Kalva Chomed and learn from Ama Ivriya that she can be uh, acquired with money, uh, although not with Bia. So this uh, wife who can be acquired with Bia, all the more so she can be acquired with money. So now we restore the Kalva Chomed. Even though we just restored the Kalva Chomed, the, the, um, we go back to the Pasuk and say, Tamud Lomar, ki kach ishisha. We need the Pasuk, ki kach ishisha gezera shava. Okay, now we have to explain the structure. Ha, lama li kedah. Wait, why do I need the, the Pasuk? Ha, we just showed, we just showed that we have a Kalva Chomed. So to explain the structure here, Amar Rav Ashe. Mishum te'ika lememar, me'ikara de dina pircha. Because I, I have a challenge to the Kalva Chomed, from all the way from the beginning, from the Ama Ivriya source. Mecha kamaitita me Ama Ivriya. Mala Ama Ivriya shiken yosa bekesef. Toma bezo shena yosa bekesef. Wait a second. Ama Ivriya, it makes sense that she can be acquired with money because she also is released with money, right? At the end, uh, uh, someone wants to redeem the Ama Ivriya. They can pay money. And uh, that's how she gets her freedom. Whereas for a marriage, you can't get out of a marriage by just giving the ring back or paying the husband. Um, uh, only works with get and mita tabaal. So you see that they are fundamentally different, and this breaks the kava chomer. That's why tamudamar ki kach ish. That's why I need the pasuk ki ha ki ha mi afron because I would not be able to learn it from a kava chomer. All right, good. So that's um, now we explain why we could, could not learn it from a Kalva Chomer. Now we want to know finally, why do we need two scriptural derivations for Kiddushet Kesef? We, I need the Pasuk from the double language uh, and Kasef and that extra Yod. And I also need the Kikach Ish, that's the Kicha Kicha Mister Efron. I need both of these to teach me Kiddushet Kesef. If you only had kicha kicha efron, so who receives money when they sell something, right? The the uh, seller by get, gets the money. So I might think that also here that she is selling herself in a way, selling the right uh, for anyone to marry her, so that she, therefore she should get the money in all cases. I would think that the wife receives the case uh, receives the money even if she's a minor and she has a father. That's what I would think. That's why I need the pasuv yaseachinam and kasef and kasef la don ze avayesh kasef la don acher to teach me that the father receives the money when she when the when he marries off his minor daughter. That's why I need yaseachinam. V'katav rachamana yaseachinam havamina hechad yavale ihi ledide v'kidashto havu kidushe katav rachamana ki kach velo ki ti kach. If I only had. The second, the, the pasuk biasachinam. I would think that let's say she, the bride, uh, gives the groom a a uh, a ring, right? And sehare at mikudash li. I would think that maybe that's also okay, right? You could do it this way. You could do it that way. We're very egalitarian. Um, therefore, the pasuk says no ki kach. Ish Isha, the man has to take the woman, he has to acquire the woman. He is the buyer and uh, the buyer has to give money to the seller. Uh, whether the seller is her, she herself or her father is giving over that right. So he has to, has to be one way, he has to give the money and he has to say, Okay, good. Now we finish with Kiddushet Kesef. Next, 
the um, Kiddushin can also be effectuated through Bi'ah. How do you know that? Because the Pasuk says, Kikach ish isha ub'ala, he has relations with her. So that's how we know you can do Kiddushin with Bi'ah. Now we ask, wait a second. This is all now part of the B'dayta. We're switching off. We quoted, we quoted the B'dayta, then we analyzed it. Now we're going to quote the next section of the B'dayta. And then we're going to have a similar analysis. Uh, so the B'dayta says, Why do I need um, this pasuk? I could figure out from my kavachomet. I can learn from a yevama. Uh, yevama and yevama. He cannot acquire her with money, but he can acquire her with bi'ah. So bi'ah is stronger than money. Uh, so then a bride who can be acquired through money, all the more so bi'ah should work. Bi'ah is stronger than money. Uh, no, Amavriya will be will break that kavachomer sheniknet bekesef veniknet bbiya because a master can acquire Amavriya with money but not with bia. So we see that bia is not always stronger than kesef. However, mala Amavriya shen kinyana l'shum ishut ma bezoshi kinyana l'shum ishut. Now we say, hold on, leave Amavriya out of it. That acquisition is only for is is to acquire her work as a slave, but that's not for marriage, so leave that totally out and compare the other two that are more similar, uh, Yevama and a bride, are both uh, being acquired for the purpose of marriage. So the Kavachomet is good. Tamud Omar, Uba'ala. And then uh, the uh, Braita ends, therefore we learn Uba'ala. Now, okay, we have to ask about the structure, because we ended up saying, we have a good Kavachomet, and then it says, Tamud Omar, Uba'ala. So now we have to explain. Wait a second. Why do I need the pasuk? We just said that you have a kavachomer. Ravashe explains because in between here there's yet another question. Besides the challenge to the kavachomer that we presented and, and explained, there is actually another challenge that we we are, are suggesting from the very source. Mehecha kamaititla mi yevama. What's the source of your kabachomet? Yevama. Ma yevama shekhen zikuka ve'omedet. Yevama, why is be our work uh, in yevama? Because she's already standing, uh, awaiting, right? She has a connection. She can't marry anybody else. She's almost like she's mikudeshet in some way already. Once the husband dies, she is ready, waiting, for the act of Yibum. And that's why Yibum works for Yevama. But that's not true for a regular bride. She's just a regular single woman and she has no connection at all to this particular uh, guy who's going to be her, her the, the groom. And so I would think that there, you can't just jump right into Bi'ah, it's not going to work. First, you have to do Kiddush Kesef. Then it establishes a, uh, a relationship of exclusivity. And then afterwards, you could do Nisu'in with Bi'ah. So, I'm at these, uh, so I uh, would think that Yevama is not comparable to a regular bride who is single. That's why I need the Pasuk, Ub Allah. So now we explained the, uh, the Braita in full. Um, so we totally, so far we finished explaining the source, in fact two sources for Kiddush uh, Kesef, and we ex examined the source for Bi'ah and explained why that's not a Kavachomer, and tomorrow we'll start off with the derivation for Kiddushin Bishtar. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.